merciful, mighty, powerful, strong. And he loves you so much. Good morning. Welcome to Shades Crest. We are glad to have you here this morning for worship with us. Uh, if you are new to Shades Crest, we would love to learn more about you, love to be able to connect with you in some way. One way that you could really help us do that uh, is by taking the worship guide that you received on the way in and scanning the QR code. Uh, just to let us know that you were here, we would love to know more about you or connect with someone uh, on, on your way in or out. Uh-oh. <laughs> uh, but no, regardless, we are glad that you're here this morning. You see people uh, around uh, walking right now. Uh, this is a moment in our service where we, uh, we just responded to God through singing and through worship, uh, and we're responding to God now through giving, uh, through taking what he has given and giving it back to him. And you can see on the screen behind you uh, several ways uh, that you can give. Um, and so... Uh, would you consider now uh, opening your Bibles? Actually, you know what? I'm just going to reset. I got a little shook by the uh, static. We're here now. Go ahead and take your Bibles. Open them with me to Matthew chapter 5. And we're going to be looking at verses 27 through 48. We're, we're going to be covering the rest of Matthew 5 today. And as you're turning there, I'm gonna go ahead and pray and then we'll jump into God's word. Oh Lord, we thank you for the ways that you have shown your faithfulness to us, that you have shown your goodness to us. And as we are in this season of thanksgiving, it is appropriate for us to raise the thousand little ways and the thousand big ways in our hearts that you show your goodness to us. And so we thank you. And we ask today as we read your word and hear it read that you would open our eyes and open our hearts, open up our whole selves so that we may respond to you and to others in the same goodness that you yourself have shown us that we would be children of God, not just in name, but in action. And we thank you for Jesus who is our forerunner in that. Help us to see him and his way more clearly today. And we ask for your Holy Spirit's help in that to teach us and to empower us to do what is good and what is right in the eyes of God. And we ask that in Jesus' name, amen. Have you ever been in the middle of learning something, maybe a seminar or a class, and wondered, does this even matter? Have, 
Perhaps you have, uh, I'm seeing some heads shaking. I know this is a common thing to pick on when this kind of thing comes up. And I know that we have English teachers in the room and I'm sorry to say, uh, for me, one of those things was always diagramming sentences. Um, frankly, I didn't know that people still diagram sentences until this morning uh, when I asked just to make sure and, and it still happens. Okay, it still happens. English teacher just confirmed. Um, I love language and figuring out how language works. I think it's important. I think parts of speech are important, but for some reason for me, when it came to putting, taking a sentence apart and putting it in a tree form, that wasn't a particularly helpful exercise, at least, the, at least how I was processing it. Uh, and I would often wonder, why am I doing this? Perhaps you have a thing like that, where you've been in some sort of learning environment and wondered, does this matter? Jesus in Matthew 5 is speaking on what righteousness looks like in the kingdom of heaven. Uh, he says that unless our righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, we won't be able to enter into the kingdom of heaven. He says that he's not come to abolish the law or the prophets, but to fulfill it. And then he starts going into these examples. And as I was thinking about how this passage kind of hits us today in our moment, I couldn't help but worry or fear that perhaps you might hear me saying, we're gonna talk about God's righteousness today and just be like, does that matter? Does righteousness matter? Is that an outdated concept? And I just wanted to be honest about that because I don't think that we can hear it as a word for us unless we kind of confront the fact that sometimes, at least it feels to me very pervasive in our particular moment that a lot more people seem to care about being right than doing right. And by that, I mean being right in an argument than doing right. We seem to be increasingly polarized to the point that ethics, doing good and being good has been lost at the expense of being right and having the right moral stand on a particular thing without actually worrying about being moral, being good as God has called us to do. And, and I think what Jesus would remind us here in just way after way is that ethics matter, that doing good matters, and that being righteous as the people of God in our time matters. Uh, and, and that if we are gonna be the children of God walking in his way, we have to let God's spirit radically transform every single part of who we are so that we can embody this kind of righteousness that Jesus is talking about. Uh, last week, we see uh, Nick showed us, Jesus is entering into this pattern of showing what righteousness looks like in the kingdom of heaven. And the way that he's doing that is he takes these Old Testament laws, some of which are moral laws, some of which are judicial laws. You don't have to get into the uh, differences between those things, but just know that he's pulling from the Old Testament and saying, you've heard it was said this, but I say to you this. And Jesus is sort of expanding the ethic, the righteousness of what it means to be God's child, to live as God's people in the kingdom of heaven. And so last week he looks at murder and says, the Old Testament says, don't murder. That's a good rule. That's a really good rule. I think society functions well when we don't murder. But Jesus says, but actually, that's not the line of being good. That's not the line of righteousness. The, the line is actually, when you are angry with someone, be quick to reconcile. Be quick to pursue doing right by someone when there is disagreement there. That the line isn't the external action of killing someone. The line is actually harboring bitterness in your heart towards another that would lead to things like murder. Do you see what he's doing there? So he's kind of taking the principle and getting to the heart underneath it. Today, we're gonna to look at five more times that he does that. We're gonna walk through the rest of Matthew five because I think we see a general pattern and it's that general pattern I wanna look at of righteousness that kind of pervades our whole self. I think that the first thing that we would see from this text is that 
Jesus is interested in a righteousness that would pervade our whole self, not just our actions. So I think it's helpful for us just to read this. And I wanna warn you that because it's 20 verses. That's a lot to read together in a public space, but like let's zone in together and, and hear that. And then we'll come back and talk about each example a little bit and kind of big picture what Jesus is doing. So we see starting in verse 27, him picking up on this, you have heard it said, but I say to you, you've heard that it was said, do not commit adultery. But I tell you, everyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. It was also said, whoever divorces his wife must give her a written notice of divorce. But I tell you, everyone who divorces his wife, except in a case of sexual immorality, causes her to commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Again, you have heard that it was said to our ancestors, you must not break your oaths, but you must keep your oaths to the Lord. But I tell you, don't make an oath at all, either by heaven, because it is God's throne, or by the earth, because it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, because it is the city of the great king, do not swear by your head because you cannot make a single hair white or black, but let your yes mean yes and your no mean no. Anything more than this is from the evil one. You've heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, don't resist an evildoer. On the contrary, if anyone slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other to him also. As for the one who wants to sue you and take away your shirt, let him have your coat as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to the one who asks you and don't turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. You've heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be children of your father in heaven. For he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward will you have? Don't even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers and sisters, what are you doing out of the ordinary? Don't even the Gentiles do the same? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. This is the word of the Lord. So Jesus, again, is expanding this idea of righteousness to involve our whole self. Uh, we, we pick up in verse 27, where he, he says to not commit adultery. Uh, again, like the murder command, a good ethic, a good command. And yet he says that in the kingdom of heaven, righteousness would go beyond that to where the issue isn't adultery as, it, as much as it is objectifying another human to make them about you. He says the one who would look on a person lustfully in their own heart has already done it. They have already committed adultery. The issue then isn't the act. The issue is actually deeper than that. It's how do you view other people? Are other people primarily about you and your desires? Or are they people in their own right? That's, you see, Jesus getting to the heart, getting below the surface of the action into the reality kind of going on inside. Uh, then he goes to divorce. He looks at this specific Old Testament allowance of divorce procedure, which is, if you're gonna do it, this is how you do it. And it's in Deuteronomy, he, Moses lays it out. And I, I wanna be careful doing this because this is, first of all, ancient Jewish and Roman marriage and divorce is not a one-to-one -to, -one to what marriage looks like in uh, 2024 in America. So we, we should be careful drawing inferences from one of the others, but I think generally we can say that Jesus is looking at people who are cavalierly ending their marriages, primarily from a position of power, and saying, maybe take the institution of marriage and what God is doing a little bit more seriously than that. That something big is happening when you just decide to end that. We actually do have a couple of, actually we have several written divorce records from the first century AD, uh, even in the Jewish world, so we can kind of get a good picture of what people were splitting up over. Uh, and first of all, we can say that it's almost entirely male because that's just the uh, society in which it was 
Jesus was living in and speaking to. Another thing that we can say is there were a lot of reasons that people were filing for separation and a lot of understandings in how Old Testament law was looked at that rabbis were saying, this is an okay reason, this is not an okay reason. And there was disagreement, but the general consensus was a husband can divorce his wife for a host of reasons. Uh, we have written examples of people divorcing their wife uh, for, I kid you not, uh, a bad meal, uh, which sounds hilarious and sad. Uh, we also have, I just like somebody better. There was a, a true power move and just people leaving marriages for convenience into something more desirable. And Jesus is speaking into that particular moment and not just drawing the line at when can you divorce, but actually trying to idealize marriage in the, in the instance of saying, this is what God actually is doing here. And so maybe take that a little bit more seriously. Maybe try loving your spouse instead of just looking for reasons to leave. That doesn't mean that there aren't reasons and if you wanna talk in the nuance of that, we can do that, I would be glad to. But generally what Jesus is doing here is calling the righteous standard to be a little bit more than just when can you leave uh, or why can I get out and just saying, take it a little bit more seriously and try loving. And that's his general ethic everywhere. So this really falls in line with his general ethic that he's laying out. Um, the next thing that he says is oaths uh, where he says, you must, in verse 23 or 33, you must not break your oaths, but you must keep your oaths to the Lord. This doesn't really matter to us. I, probably in your mind as you read that, you're just like, okay, great, so keep your oaths. And then Jesus says, but don't make an oath at all. Um, this was a big deal. This is probably the biggest deal in, in large ways of disrupting everyday life in the ancient world where they were constantly making oaths to God as a proof of what they were saying. Uh, we still have remnants of this in our, in our life, even 2,000 years later. You'll say sometimes in a conversation, swear to God or on God, or more formally, do you swear to tell the whole truth, nothing but the truth, so help me God. Of calling on these higher things to confirm what, our, what we're saying is true. And Jesus is saying, just be true. Just tell the truth. So much so that you don't have to have an oath to confirm what you're saying is true. People don't have to leave a conversation with you and wonder, did I just get lied to? Your words should be such that you don't need an oath to back it up. And so Jesus is saying, that's great that you keep your oaths, but what if you just always kept your word regardless of your oaths? He's digging deeper into what it means to be righteous uh, then he gets into uh, what is commonly known as the law of retribution. The, you've heard that it was said an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. This is very common in the ancient world. We not only have it in the Bible, we have it in other kind of cultures uh, where basically it was meant to ensure that if a wrong was done civilly, it was met in kind. So literally, you take my eye, I get your eye. You take my tooth, I get your tooth. It was meant to kind of govern to make sure that people didn't step beyond uh, claiming what was theirs, that mob violence didn't just ensue when a wrong was committed. Uh, and, and so Jesus is saying, that's a good law, civilly. What's better is nonviolence to those who would treat you wrong. What's better is when someone slaps you on your cheek, a massive sign of disrespect in the ancient world, turn the other cheek. And he encourages this radical nonviolence and then generosity of if people are gonna ask you for money, just give it to them. Uh, people reading this, it's very funny reading kind of how to apply this ethic socially. It doesn't really work uh, in, in societies uh, because we live in a broken world. And yet, even in that, Jesus is calling us to this. He's saying that the general pattern in our heart should be one of nonviolence and radical generosity. And I wanna be careful here as well because I know that there are people in positions of abuse and you might read this passage and think that God is telling you to stay in an abusive situation. That is not what's happening. And passages like this could be used in that way. And so I wanna be careful to say that that is not what God is calling you to, but generally what God is calling us to as a people, individually in our hearts is 
first responding with nonviolence, first responding with an other-centered ethic to where our lives is for the good of others and we trust God and the community of faith to look after us uh, in those situations where wrong might ensue. Um, that is the general ethic of the people of God is that nonviolent, generos- generosity-driven spirit. And then he kind of hits the hammer, the nail on the head in verse 43. You've heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Uh, Elsewhere in the gospels, Jesus will refer to that as the greatest commandment, love your neighbor. But he says that that's not enough. (laughs) Don't just love your neighbor, but love your enemies. Love those who persecute you, pray for them. He's calling us not just to love those who look like us, not just our people. It's easy to love our people is what he says. And Jesus elsewhere will define neighbor as everybody, not just those like us, not just those who live down the road from us, that we are called to radically love and seek good and benefit for all people, even those who aren't like us, and even those who would want to do wrong to us. Uh, And he grounds that not just in a principle of it's the right thing to do, but he grounds that as that's what God does. (laughs) And, And as children of God, you would be like God. So we're gonna take a breath right now because we just walked through a lot of specific kind of case studies of what it means to be righteous in the kingdom of heaven. And if I had to guess, I would say that some of those probably touched close to home for some of us and a lot of us. At various points in my past month, I feel like either directly or indirectly, my life has been touched by every single one of those that either perhaps you've sinned or fallen short in one of those ways, or you've been sinned against in one of those ways. And you still, you can't explain why, but you feel the grossness from being even close to it. You feel affected by it. And so there's a heaviness that comes with that kind of talk that I want to acknowledge. And then ask big picture, what is Jesus doing here? And I think what Jesus is doing here is that he is giving us an understanding of righteousness that would involve our whole self, not just our actions. That we are being called to be righteous in the kingdom of God if we're gonna be his children in a way that would involve not only our actions, but our emotions, our thoughts, how you feel about people, how you feel about things, how you think about things, and how you act. Our whole self is wrapped up in what it means to honor God in how we live. Have you ever been watching a sporting event, uh, could be football, basketball, really anything, the thought triggered to me because I was watching it on a football game last week, where you see a team that is doing all the right technical things and yet they just are almost painful to watch because it feels like there's no passion in how they're playing. Uh, that sometimes when I played basketball would be what made my coach the maddest uh, was when we were actually kind of technically executing what we were being asked to do, uh, but we just looked lifeless. Passion matters, and the emotion behind the action matters. And what Jesus is saying is the Old Testament laws give a good ethic by which to run society. The problem is when sinful people do them, even if they keep it, it could, you could do the law and in no way be honoring God in your heart, and your thought process, we can keep rules, can't we? That has nothing to do with honoring God necessarily. And so when we read the Sermon on the Mount, when we read Jesus digging into the commands in ways that make us uncomfortable, it's because he's touching those parts of us that we maybe yet haven't fully surrendered over to him. And maybe in our hearts, we don't want to surrender to him. And he's calling us into a greater righteousness that would involve our whole self, our actions, our emotions, our thoughts, every part of us. And that kind of leads me into the second thing he's wanting to show us about righteousness. Not only does it involve our whole self, but righteousness as it's presented here in the Sermon on the Mount, I think is something primarily that has to be given to us 
before it can be lived by us. Uh, because he, he finishes in verse 48, this is kind of Jesus' crown jewel, his summary statement. He says, be perfect therefore, as your heavenly father is perfect. So you read all these, and I was reading all these, and I've gotta be honest with you, I mean, I think these are good laws, it's good sayings, and then you get to be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. And that makes total sense based on what he says. The only problem I see in it is it's horrible news because I am not perfect. And I don't think you are either, I'm sorry to say. I think we hear this and it's a bit of a deflator because we are not people in our whole selves who honor God and love others in our actions, in our emotions, in our thoughts. You probably heard everything I just said a minute ago. You're like, yeah, the, ideally, Jesus, that is really, really good. That is an ethic that we should strive for. And in no way am I capable of meeting it. it I can try and that's good. And I would rather us try than not try. I think the world works better when we try but we have to be honest and say, goodness, it can sure be deflating if we try to put our identity into how well we fit this. Because I might be able to control my actions most of the time, but I can't control my emotional reality. I can speak to it when I see it getting out of whack or I can kind of speak to my thoughts, but man, they just happen, don't they? It's hard to do that. And so when we hear Jesus saying, be perfect, we have to acknowledge that we are not and that we can't be. And that's when he says your righteousness has to be greater than the scribes or the Pharisees, this is what he's talking about. He's talking about a righteousness that would involve our whole selves. And that's something that no human can do. It reminds me of Matthew 19, when Jesus is talking to this young man who comes up to him and he says, uh, teacher, what? can I do to have eternal life? It's such a good question. And, and Jesus says, well, and he kind of does what he did here. He's like, you've heard the commandments and he starts listing the 10 commandments and the young guy is like, that's great. I do all of those. Uh, and you can tell he's expecting Jesus to be like, well, congratulations, buddy, you're righteous. Uh, you've got it. And then Jesus says something that is not in the Old Testament. It's not in the Bible. He says, great. Well, then here's what you got to do now. Go sell everything you have and give it to the poor and then follow me and you'll have treasure in heaven. And the man goes away sad. Jesus pulls this principle out seemingly out of nowhere. And he turns to his disciples and says, it's hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And then the disciples naturally are like looking at this guy who's a commandment keeper. He's this good leader in society. And they hear Jesus say that and they say, well, who then can be saved? And Jesus says, with man, it's impossible. But with God, all things are possible. It's this beautiful instance of, even with the, the young ruler, Jesus digging into the heart of, what is the place that I can speak to you where you would see you don't have it in you to be righteous as I've called you to be righteous. And with the rich young ruler, it was sell everything you have, give it to the poor and follow me. You might have a different point where you come in here maybe thinking you're an awesome person. Some of you are fully aware that you're not and are so full of shame over it that it has affected your entire worldview and view of yourself. And you need to hear all of us. Jesus has shut all of us up in not able to do it on our own mode. You are not uniquely bad if you feel the weight of this on you. In fact, we all should. Because the truth is there's only one person who is able to keep righteousness to this degree. There's only one person who is able to be righteous before God with their whole self, with their actions, with their thoughts, with their emotions. And it's the person who is saying these things in Matthew 5. It is, as 1 Timothy calls him, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. His identity is one that is full of righteousness full of goodness. And so we can hear these commands from him knowing he is living them. And thankfully we can hear them knowing that he lived his whole life so that he might gift them to us as his standard 
Uh, 2 Corinthians 5 says beautifully that Jesus who knew no sin became sin for us. And why did he do that? So that we would become the righteousness of God. That we who can't meet that on our own, we can't do all of these, you've heard it said, but I say to you as Jesus said. You might be able to do some of it for a little bit, but you can't do all of it all the time. If you try, it's like Jenga. Uh, you know the game Jenga? Some of you probably will be playing Jenga next week with family over Thanksgiving. It's something that I love doing. I've, I almost brought a Jenga tower up here and I decided that would be just, the OCD person in me was like, that's a bad idea. Um, Jesus is like taking the Jenga pieces by which we would identify ourselves as good enough and righteous and knocking them out not to destroy our self-esteem, but, but, but to turn us to him so that we can see he is everything that we need. He is our righteous standard and that we can actually relax. We actually can exhale in faith and say that God in Jesus sees us as righteous, that God has gifted to us the righteous standard that he has called us to live. He has said, be righteous. We in our brokenness say, we can't. And he says, you are in Jesus. This is who you are. Righteousness as the people of God, yes, it is something that we strive for, but we don't strive for it to meet it. We strive for it because Jesus has already declared that we are. You are righteous. You are good. You are a child of God regardless of how well or how poorly you execute the 10 commandments or Jesus's ethic in the Sermon on the Mount, your identity has been changed radically by what Jesus has done for you. And I don't think there's any better place to see that than in what we're about to do, which is partaking of the Lord's Supper. Because it is in the Lord's Supper that Jesus actually gives us tangibly our identity in him. It is in the elements of bread and juice that as we partake it, we receive Jesus for us. We admit that on our own, we can't do it. And so what we need is union with him. We need God to look at us through the lens of Jesus. And so the word I would have for us today, and I think God has for us today, primarily is one word, receive. Would you be willing to receive from Jesus the righteous standard that he's called you to? Would you quit trying to find an identity in either performing or finding your identity in shame over not performing. Are you called to repentance? Absolutely. Are you called to love God with your whole self? Definitely. Does that impact who you are? Does that inform your identity? Not at all. Because Jesus has already declared you to be righteous. And so this morning, would you receive that? Would you receive the righteousness that he has given for you, the love that he has for you? And would you rest in him? Uh, so we're gonna pray now, and then we're gonna sing and respond to the Lord uh, in partaking of the Lord's Supper. Father, we love you, and we thank you for Jesus. It is no exaggeration to say that he is everything for us. We thank you that you care about righteousness, that you care about your world running rightly. But thankfully, even though we are called to it, we don't have to find our identity in what we do or don't do. We get to find our identity in who you are for us. So let us look to Jesus, rest in him, and receive all that we would have from him. I ask that in Jesus' name, amen.
can be seated as we reflect together on what Jesus did for us. We want to do three things. We do this every time we partake the Lord's Supper. We want to look back and remember Jesus and what he has done for us and ensuring that he was not calling us to anything he was not willing to do for us himself. And so we can see the sacrifice that he has made for us and be glad that in Jesus, we are righteous. In Jesus, we are loved children of God. And there's not a thing, a single thing, any of us can do to change that. It is who we are. As John, John says in 1 John, we are children of God, and that is who we are. We look back and remember, we look in and repent, because there are ways, if we're honest, that we know that we've not in our whole self loved God, and we've not loved our neighbor as ourself. And we wanna acknowledge those and repent of those. And then we want to look forward and rejoice because there is a day when we will meet face-to-face -face Jesus, the righteous one. We will meet the one who has given everything for us, the one who has loved us even when we were at our most unlovely. He will bring us to himself, he will return for us, and that is a day worth rejoicing. And so it's with that in mind that we can look back on the words of Jesus when he was looking at those who he loved and he took the bread in his hand and he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Take and eat. And then after that, he lifted up the cup and he said, this is the, my blood, the blood of the new covenant for the forgiveness of sins for you. Take and drink. Amen. Well, what a beautiful place to end. I love, I love it when the people of God get to be together and to celebrate in tangible ways the good news of Jesus. And, and maybe your next step today would be to trust in Jesus, to receive Jesus for the first time. If that's you, we have people who would love on either exit on your way out to talk with you more about what that would look like. Uh, or if you have something that we could just be praying about. Again, we have people ready to pray for you. Um, we've also got a few announcements I wanna let you know about. Uh, first and foremost, Skip Taylor uh, uh, joined our church two weeks ago. You can see his picture behind me. Would you welcome Skip and just let him know that you're glad to have him here. Uh, second thing, um, Operation Christmas Child, today is the deadline to get your shoe boxes turned in. I was told shortly or before coming up here that if they are in by Wednesday, they will still be counted. We will not turn them away if they show up tomorrow. Uh, but please get them in as soon as possible uh, for those shoe boxes. And then lastly, uh, we are in the middle of budget season, preparing our 2025 budget. So on your way out, there will be people handing copies of the proposed budget for the new church year. Wednesday night, we will have a business meeting to discuss that. Uh, and then Sunday, following week, so next Sunday, there will be a vote on the budget uh, right after service with no discussion. It's just a vote. Uh, so be sure to grab that on the way out. Uh, would you uh, join me in prayer now as we dismiss together? Lord, we thank you for Jesus, the righteous one who has given us all that we need, all that we have been asked to do, he has done for us. And so we ask that you would help us to trust him, to look to him, to find our whole self in him. We thank you for Jesus in his name. Amen. Good job. That was awesome.